I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, a number of instances of anti-Semitism in the midst of the public outcry in response to the horrific murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman. And doesn't it always seem to be the case that whenever there is a problem or an issue, there are those who cast aspersion on Jews. Well, for some comment and insight, I'm most pleased to welcome back to L'Chaim a dear friend, Rabbi Abraham Cooper, Associate Dean at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, where he's also the director of the center's Global Social Action Agenda. And I hope most of you are familiar with the most important work being done by the Simon Wiesenthal Center, named after the renowned Nazi hunter and survivor himself of the Shoah, Simon Wiesenthal. And Abe, it is wonderful to see you again, even if it's you know, by Zoom. You, and thank you so much for joining us again on JBS. My honor. You have a very important uh, platform. And God bless you for sticking at it for all these years. Not easy working with Jews. Thank you very much. Okay, so Abe, it goes without saying that American Jewry shares the outrage and repulsion over the senseless, mean murder of George Floyd. And to the extent to which racism still is a reality in the lives of African Americans, Every American Jew has enormous empathy and wants to see this country realize its ideal and vision of total equality of opportunity for all. And I've said repeatedly on JBS, it is impossible to be a good Jew and a racist. Racism and Judaism are simply incompatible. And we all look for the Floyd family to receive full justice under the law. And we hope this tragedy will move the leaders of this country to seriously address the stain of racism and the needs of the African-American community, especially those in the underclass. And again, I believe every American Jew, every American hopes for the same thing. So what I want you to address, Abe, is the extent to which anti-Semitism may have found its way into this tragic event and whether it's of a serious concern to you or a very little concern to you. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, Very eloquently put, so we don't have to go over that basic territory of menschlichkeit and uh, being good citizens and being involved neighbors. And the truth is, We all need to step up our game in each of those uh, arenas. You know, the Wiesenthal Center is an aggressive, well-known Zionist Jewish human rights group. We're also home to the Museum of Tolerance that for now nearly two decades has trained almost 180,000 law enforcement and educators uh, on these third rail issues of uh, racial profiling and all these related uh, areas. Rabbis need not apply for that job, but the professionals and the Holocaust survivors to interact with them, you know, first and foremost, it's never good policing. And secondly, if you're not of the community in the world we live in today, it means there could be big problems. So that's a baseline. Uh, Beyond that, we have a a couple of other uh, challenges that we're going to have to um, uh, look at. But I say that the first one is whether we're rabbis, teachers, neighbors. Uh, I think what we've learned during this time of a broken national political discourse before this happened, that we have to look more and more to the local level, city council people, the clergy down the block, in a house of worship you pass 100 times, we'd never think about ever stopping in. So we need to open up lines of communication and figure out ways to know our neighbors and for them to know us, for them to understand what our concerns are. And that's not a small, may sound simple, it isn't, but that's definitely needs to be part of our baseline of going forward. 
on, on the other hand, with, before talking about the Jewish dimension, uh, many of us, many Americans, including some of the protesters, are concerned that um, there hasn't been enough of explicit condemnation of the thugs who made their way into this scenario to wreak such havoc uh, in cities across the U.S. Last Sunday, in a matter of a few hours, 1,200 businesses were destroyed in a little town called Santa Monica, California. On the first uh, day in the West Coast, you have the situation uh, starting in the Pan Pacific Park, which is in the famous Fairfax area, and which was went very well. The protesters, uh, you know, put the community, the rest of the community in the world on notice, in very powerful ways with powerful imagery. And then the route that they took, which then devolved, taken over by rioters, passed through a significantly Jewish area and included um, uh, Palestinian and anti-Semitic spray painting on a conservative synagogue. Uh, two other synagogues were tagged. And along with the many other uh, businesses, non-Jewish businesses, that were destroyed, you know, it was Jewish bakery, was a place that sold kosher vitamins, uh, you know, the pharmacy, etc. So we honestly don't know yet if there are dots to connect, if any part of this subgroup has a specific or had a specific anti-Semitic uh, goal. I think we have a re dual responsibility, finding out if there are dots to c connect, if there aren't, making sure that our constituencies understand that. And if there are, making sure that law enforcement and other agencies get to the bottom of it and deal with it. And that also means we need a response and a sensitivity for the political establishment. So far, I would say on both coasts that there hasn't been, um, uh, let's say that the concerns of the Jewish community have not been put yet on the front burner, not in L.A. and not in New York. And what in some ways, it's totally Abe, understandable. Abe, what concerns are those? So the explicit concerns would have to be when you have attacks uh, that seem to target, may have targeted Jews, the Jewish community, qua Jews, we call that anti-Semitism, uh, that it needs to be investigated. But the numbers of... Uh, of businesses and the thousands of people now thrown out of work is so much bigger than the Jewish community. On a certain level, we can understand that absolutely we all have to show stand shoulder to shoulder with everyone right. because we're dealing with a much greater issue. Yeah. Having said that, we don't have to apologize for expressing our concerns. Secondly, is the issue of Black Lives Matters. Now, I think to most American Jews and I hope most Americans, uh, black lives matter to everyone. But it's also true since Ferguson uh, brought about the black lives uh, movement back in Missouri in, a, in a, another American tragedy, that there are players within this movement who see um, uh, Farrakhan as a hero, as a photo opportunity. Well, for a man who called Adolf Hitler, a great man. Don't expect an institution that bears the name Simon Wiesenthal Center, named after a man who lost 89 members of his family, along with the 6 million other Jews who were murdered. Uh, that doesn't compute. And I want to emphasize, that doesn't mean we disengage. Quite the contrary, from our point of view, we're deeply engaged with African American leaders across the country. But I think whether you're left, right, or center, whether you're 20 years old or, as I'm approaching, 70 years old, we need to have enough self-respect to say we'll sit down with anyone who's ready to respect us for who we are, and we need to have our ears, eyes, uh, and brains open to sit down with anyone who's ready to deal on that kind of level. It remains to be seen what role, uh, if any, uh, the uh, this quote-unquote movement uh, is going to play, or whether it's the the leaders in place across the United States, and I really have been exposed to in the last 
uh, two, three years with some amazing members of the clergy, Christian, Muslim, even some Jews who threatened to give religion a good name. Uh, these are people already deeply committed and involved who never get on TV, who never get quoted, but who are, they're the ones who are going to make the difference on the front lines. So I think that challenge of being able to explain to, uh, to our uh, African-American neighbors who are in deep pain uh, that, they all, the, that everyone needs to understand our concerns as well. I'd say going forward, those are the two issues, three issues. Number one, we have to be there for our neighbors who are in pain. Number two, uh, we want uh, everyone involved in this mix that expects the members of the Jewish community to sit, come forward that we want to sit together with people who don't necessarily see the, say, the world the same way we do, and we don't want to bring them to that worldview, but they have to show basic respect. Uh, embracing the ideology of a man who said that Hitler is a great man should be a, a red line for any Jew of any age. And the third uh, item is, uh, let's be perfectly honest, again, it's not Jewish per se. America right now, we have a broken political and social discourse before the, this terrible tragedy. We had the virus, we had other issues. We had the greatest spike in violent anti-Semitic hate crimes in the street of, streets of New York in the months before everything here is sort of gone wobbly. So, uh, and the political leadership uh, in, in, uh, across the country have not always been there. And, uh, and you know how it works with Americans. When things are quiet, we want the police to be social workers. When, when things go out of control, we want them to, uh, you know, snap their fingers and take back control of the streets. In the world we live in today, that's not so simple. And especially, I think, the single biggest game changer across the board is social media. I, I think it was Winston Churchill. Maybe your views can correct me. Um, but uh, it was Churchill or someone else who said, that a lie can tra often travel around the world before the truth can put its pants on. And that's what social media is about. And that's why the Wiesenthal Center spends so much effort on its uh, research uh, uh, in the U.S. and globally on, on how extremists leverage uh, this technology uh, for, their, uh, for their approach. And, and finally, I just want to repeat something I witnessed in 1980. So you see, I, I can confirm an old man. When I was with Simon Wiesenthal during uh, a swing through the Midwest, he was lecturing primarily at synagogues and some campuses. And at one campus, uh, an undergraduate uh, got up and he said, Mr. Wiesenthal, could it happen again? And I'll paraphrase as close as I can for the actual wording. He said the following. He said, uh, look, if you have uh, hate, organized hate, if you have technology and you have a uh, crisis, anything could happen. He said, and this is decades before the Internet, he said that if the technology that was available to Hitler, this propaganda, if that had been uh, available, De uh, centuries before, quote, no Jew would have survived in Spain, no Catholic would have survived in England, no Protestant would have survived in France. So from the year 1980 uh, till today, Mr. Wiesenthal's uh, words really are, they're always with me, and they should serve as a wake-up call because for those people who are watching and saying, oh, come on, our neighbors don't care, and I, I'm not comfortable, you know, speaking to a clergyman from another faith. And, you know, I don't want to get involved with the food, but whatever it might be, it's okay. Because if you don't actually bring your narrative and share your narrative with your neighbor, there are many other people out there on social media who've created alternative and pernicious um, narratives about the Jewish people, about Judaism, about Israel. So we have to individually, collectively roll up our sleeves and, yes. and stay in it. And that's really what I want to hear you talk about again. And 
I'm not, it, it seems to me that the answer you gave to my specific question was, there was some spray painting on synagogues. It was ugly. Free Palestine, F Israel. And there were businesses destroyed. And I think you are responsible in saying, at the moment, there's no evidence that that Jewish shop and that non-Jewish shop, the Jewish shop was targeted because it was a Jewish shop. There were African-American businesses absolutely burned to the ground. People lost their life savings and their life dreams. African-Americans lost their life dreams at the hands, not of protesters, but of rioters, of people who decided this was an opportunity to use violence and to loot and to destroy. And they were building nothing. And they were moving America towards nothing better. And I've been disappointed, by the way, Abe, that there is not a sharper distinction being made in much of the media between what is legitimate First Amendment protest, which should be celebrated, and ugly, violent, hateful, destructive looting which should be condemned and which should be stopped by local police authorities. And if they can't do it, you bring in help. I'm very disappointed in that. But my question for you was, wait a minute. My question for you was, to what extent is Abe Cooper at the moment worried about anti-Semitism as part of this mix or... At the moment, there are issues which are socially troubling, serious problems, but it's not anti-Semitism related to the response to the death of George Floyd. It sounds to me like you're saying there is no real evidence of any anti-Semitism at the moment tied to that event which should trouble American Jewry. Uh, I'm afraid I'd have to uh, sharpen the focus a little bit by saying we don't know yet. Uh, you have, you know, a number of other synagogues that were tagged, not specifically with anti-Semitic stuff. Social media is awash with Jew hatred, including from the coronavirus, which is not going away. So we have a tremendous amount of Jew hatred online going on 24-7. So and to what extent? To what extent are you are you seriously? Is this a, Abe? We all want to know, and I couldn't go to a better person. But you and I have known each other forever. I'm coming to you care. because I, I want to hear from you. Do you think this is should an American Jewry be worried at this point in time? Whether it's because of the coronavirus and the response to that, what? Let me give you one more example, then I, will, I want to hear what you say. The charge is made that racism is a systemic problem in America, and Israel is similarly guilty of similar racism against Palestinians. And that has been expressed. That's what was, in essence, written on the wall of a synagogue in Los Angeles. I'm asking you, Tachlis here, there are, are, is anti-Semitism on the edges and we should be concerned about it? Or does Abe Cooper feel, no, there's something more that should concern American Jews more at this moment in time? Well, I think American Jews, like most good Americans, can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Uh, we do have responsibilities as citizens uh, that we need to work together for the greater good and speak out against racism against our neighbors and be, be tr to try to be part of the response and answer to it. Having said that, you brought, what you actually brought up is the issue called intersectionality, also a byproduct of Ferguson a few years ago, in which uh, primarily pro-Palestinian activists uh, married the uh, events on the streets of a Missouri city to alleged uh, crimes and misdeeds done by Israeli uh, police and soldiers 
in the Holy Land, connecting, creating dots from nothing and connecting those dots to create a very destructive narrative, uh, which is reflected in some of the visuals we've seen posted uh, on official Palestinian sites and elsewhere that show uh, uh, two uniformed people with boots on a neck. Uh, the Minneapolis police officer and a nefarious looking Israeli soldier with his knee on the neck of a Palestinian. Those elements in the uh, quote unquote progressive movement here in the United States and online are working that really hard. They want to embed that imagery and marry the, that anger, righteous anger, about what happened to uh, a, a person whose life was literally uh, you know, taken, taken away from him in real time with the complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue that if in fact you land up agreeing with that narrative, that itself will increase dramatically, not just hatred of Israel, but hatred of anybody who can possibly support Israel. So we, we have to be extremely concerned that within the constellation of the people trying to uh, move uh, the issue of racism in America to the forefront and keep it front and center, are forces who hate Jews. That is a fact of life. What I'm, what I'm not prepared to say because I don't know, this is something more for uh, law enforcement and intelligence to figure out whether there's a direct link between those individuals who overtly don't like Jews or hate us with criminal acts that uh, were carried out uh, in, against the Jewish uh, uh, synagogues and other Jewish establishments. That is not, maybe others are happy uh, to uh, use this thing called intersectionality to make two plus two equals six. That's not where we're coming from. When you consider also that the coronavirus spawned on Telegram, one of the social media outlets, 45 channels of anti-Semitic hate, including calls you know, for people on their side, for uh, neo-Nazis who have it to go to synagogues that were not yet closed, and spread the virus to Jews, and other accusations that the Jewish people are somehow in involved from Wuhan in creating vi vicious, terrible stuff. And if you repeat a lie, used to be long enough and hard enough, it'll stick. Today on social media, you just have to say it cleverly and off it goes to the races. So this is not a time for us to let down our guard uh, or, or to you know, look at the world, look at the situation with uh, rose colored glasses. We have a, scen a scenario in the United States where shopkeepers and business owners don't know if they're going to have a business tomorrow, where the other um, uh, uh, citizens, black, white, brown, uh, Asian Americans, we're all worried and want to make sure that our law enforcement can reestablish control and peace uh, you know, on, on the street and that the coronavirus will allow us to reopen. You know, if we didn't have the virus, um, the Museum of Tolerance, our educational uh, outreach, it's been around for uh, since just before the uh, LA riots. We, the Museum of Tolerance is a recognized venue and a trusted one for all elements here uh, of the, the multifaceted, multi-ethnic, multiracial uh, California. That is, this is one of the key spaces where people would come and start trying to patch things together and uh, have a degree of honesty with each other and create alliances, some of which that have lasted for decades. Part of what we're all facing here, that space is unavailable. We don't have public space to gather. We're mostly in, in our own silos. And uh, you know, just to give you one other example, I'm not hesitating to call the spade a spade, but to give you one other example, and it cuts very much close to home. There was a visual about uh, three nights ago that was put up by, in the name of Antifa. And it basically said, well, we finished now with the shops. Now we're going to go into the white neighborhoods. And then it said, you know, except the, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, Black Lives Matter, and people in my community, I can't escape them, one way, including Iraq, you know, uh, should we get armed guards? Uh, are they coming for us? When we looked at it, uh, at this posting, I said, you know, it's interesting. They misspelled matters. So um, it turns out now, I think it was today reported already in the New York Times, that that particular posting wasn't made in California, wasn't made in New York, wasn't posted from there, somewhere in Europe, as it turns out, by a neo-Nazi trying to help stir the pot. So there's also, you know, when you have a crisis, it's tailor-made for these extremists. When you have social media where truth yes. is a suggestion, but not a requirement, we shouldn't be surprised that we're going to be bombarded. And uh, I guess what comes to my mind are those posters that the Brits wrote during World War II about be calm and carry on. Be, there's a difference between being calm and being indifferent and being silent. This is a time for us uh, to be calm, uh, to, to continue to maintain the amazing jobs that millions of families have done during the pandemic all over the world with their kids to reassure our children. But we have to have our eyes wide open uh, in, in order to see to it that the concerns of our community are at the end of the day protected and not marginalized. It is always wonderful to talk to you, Abe. And I cannot thank you enough, not simply for giving us time, and you always give me time anytime I ask you. But, you know, there are people who you have to turn to because they are aware and understand and can then articulate where we are at this point in history as a Jewish people and as part of this American experiment. So I wish you called two v'hatzlacha. You stay well, you, you and your wonderful family, wherever you are in L.A. And <laughs> sooner or later, this will be over and you yeah. and I have a chance to be together in person once again. In the meantime, thank you so much for thank giving you us Martin. time, as, as he, always, as, on JBS. As you taught me, no worries. We do have them surrounded. Thank you, my friend. Be well. God bless. Rabbi Abraham Cooper, Associate Dean at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, where he's the director of the Center's Global Social Action Agenda. I hope his insights have been helpful to your own thinking. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, to JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, to JBS transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Stay safe and be well, my friends.